I'm going to read the introduction. Yep. Okay. Welcome everybody, good afternoon. Thank you for attending this webinar uh, that is organized by Euro NMD and the, also in partnership with the European Academy of Neurology and the European Reference Networks for Rare Neurological Disorders. Uh, we have today Professor Stavros Kiviaridis, uh, to whom I thank uh, for being our speaker and taking the time to share his knowledge with us. Uh, Stavros is Professor Emeritus of the University of Geneva and adjunct professor at the University of Bern in Switzerland. And uh, previously he was the professor and chairman of the orthodontics at the University of Geneva. His research is uh, focused on masticatory muscle influence on dental facial growth and the post-emergent phases of tooth eruption diagnostic methods of oral function, dental facial aberrations in individual with neuromuscular diseases and all the physiological and physiopathological implications of that, and the outcome of different orthodontic interventions and their side effects, uh, namely in the population of neuromuscular disease patients that is, as you imagine, our target uh, also today. Uh, obviously, we don't have to remind you of the, nom of the very high number of interventions of Professor uh, Kiwiria Aridis in, in uh, congresses and universities, many awards and publications that he has. He has kindly agree to participate in a live Q&A at the end of the webinar. So although you cannot speak during the webinar, you can use the Q&A box to enter your questions. And at the end of the webinar, either you voice your question because you will be unmuted so that you can speak directly, or if need be, I can uh, read the question and Professor Stavros will uh, answer. Uh, this webinar is recorded, as I have already written in the chat box, that you can use to talk with us and between yourselves, and it will be made available on demand on the Euro NMD YouTube channel, so if you want consent to this recording, please, uh, you need to disconnect, and uh, thank you for attending and thank you, Professor Stavros uh, Kiriliadis for your uh, very uh, generous uh, participation. Thank you and the floor is entirely yours. Thank you very much, Antonio, for your kind uh, introduction. I'm very glad that I have the possibility to share with people who are closer to this group of individuals that uh, for me it was uh, uh, a group uh, that I didn't know, I didn't have uh, the slightest idea about the problems they have, but I'm going to tell you a couple of uh, things, so I'm going to have a little uh, discussion in the beginning, how I have entered to this uh, field. Actually, I would like to tell you that uh, uh, my uh, place is here in Geneva, but my origin is from Greece, and I spent 20 years in this part of the world that is Gothenburg, Sweden. And then since 1999, uh, I moved to Geneva. And now I'd like to tell you that many are thinking, okay, this person is an orthodontist, how comes that uh, he is dealing with this kind of patients? So I'd like to show you a little uh, the layout of the lecture I'm intending to uh, present. So first, I'd like uh, to talk about the influence of muscle function in the facial growth. Then we'll discuss together about clinical methods that we use to evaluate the masticatory muscles. And uh, then we'll uh, come to this uh, main topic, the facial growth disturbances in children with neuromuscular diseases. 
the orthodontic treatment and stability of children with neuromuscular diseases, and more specifically, uh, individuals suffering by myotonic dystrophy or Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And then I will end up with some future perspectives and thoughts. So, your question is how comes uh, this orthodontist has started with that? And I would like first <clears throat> uh, to ask the question orthodontists are dealing with uh, malocclusions, malpositioned teeth. Uh, and I would like to ask you how do you think how uh, many years? Or since when the conclusions exist? Well, what we can say is that uh, studies comparing human skulls or of primitive or medieval populations to those of modern populations show that uh, the prevalence and the severity of conclusions are considerably less in the medieval populations than in their modern descendants. And of course, it's not only that. It is that the craniofacial morphology of uh, the humans have changed in respect to what we have seen, what we can see from the skulls in medieval populations. Here we can see a kind of uh, figure about the mean form of uh, the skull of uh, the medieval population. Here we have the anterior cranial base, is the red one here. And here it is the maxillary plane, uh, the roof of uh, the oral cavity, let's say. And this is the mandible. And we, as we can see, the big changes that have occurred are in the mandible. And this represents uh, the occlusal plane, the teeth, and the upper and the lower incisors. So, we can say that uh, uh, during these uh, years, we have changes in the gonial angle, the mandible, and the jaws, that time were better developed than the contemporary populations. Then, of course, you may have some questions why on earth we discuss about uh, this form of uh, uh, phase, the kind of facial morphology. And I'm going to open a parenthesis and uh, tell you that uh, here we have uh, the relation that it is linked uh, between the craniofacial morphology and the malocclusion, that it is very important. We have individuals who have a big overjet, and this is often because of this anteroposterior skeletal discrepancy. And this is, for example, uh, something to compare to see how it looks a uh, normal skeletal relationship in the sense of plane. Similarly, <clears throat> you may see that uh, here we have also an anterior open bite that's severe, and often this is linked to vertical skeletal discrepancy. You see how this uh, the interrelation between the maxilla and the mandible in respect to the normal skeletal relationship. And closing this uh, parenthesis, we come back uh, to the point that we have said that uh, there are uh, different percentage of malocclusions and the severity and the changes in the morphology of uh, the individuals. And the hypothesis we had was that uh, this is associated to the musculatory muscle capacity because this was much stronger in the past. But uh, this is very easy to make hypothesis, but we need something to test the, hypo the hypothesis. And for this reason, we advanced uh, with uh, an experiment to develop animals who had uh, strong and weak muscles. Uh, the most of you, well, you are aware that uh, animal experiments, they are fed uh, rats in a specific uh, situation. They are fed with these pellets, they are very hard. 
and the change that we made was to turn the food to software. And uh, by that, we thought that if we change the consistency of the diet, the chewing capacity could be altered in the growing bud, and by that, could give uh, changes in the masticatory muscles. And when we follow these animals, after four weeks, when they're growing animals, we realized that, for example, the thickness of the muscle fibers of the rats getting a soft diet was much smaller. While for the digastric that was not involved in biting the procedure, the thickness was more or less the same. What is uh, the result of uh, differences in uh, the thickness of the muscle fibers? Yes, it is the contraction capacity these muscles have. And when we stimulate the muscles, we could see that uh, while we had the young ones with a bite force that was about three newtons, after four weeks, those having a hard diet got six newtons, while those getting a uh, soft diet, they had about four and a half newtons, which means that uh, the thin fibers we have observed led to smaller contraction forces, contractive forces, and less bite force. Now the question is, did we get some changes in the morphology of uh, these animals? Yes, we've seen that the mean fee morphology of these animals was completely different between the soft and the hard uh, diet groups. That means that animals uh, getting soft diet had coronial angle that was less developed as we've seen for uh, the skulls. And then we see that uh, the growth of the visceral kind was completely different. And when we have uh, tried to see what kind of uh, sites have been reacted in order to get these differences in the visceral planning. When we took sections and we uh, observed vital stains we have injected, we've seen that animals fed soft diet, they had less bone acquisition and they had different response to the cranial suture growth. What about the mandible? Yes, we've seen also that the mandible uh, was with less developed gonial angle, and we had differences in uh, the eruption of uh, the molars, which means that uh, this gave a certain effect uh, to these animals. And uh, we see also the condyle, that it is part of the temporomandibular joint, that it is a growth site for the mandible, responded completely different when we had hard diet in respect to soft diet. That means less stimulation in the soft diet animals. <clears throat> of course, somebody may ask, well, uh, this is what you found in uh, animals. Are these findings relevant to humans? In order to respond, we have to know how we're going to evaluate the masticatory muscle capacity of uh, the humans. And we have tried to evaluate some clinical methods. And one simple one was recorded the maximum bite force. And uh, as we can see, we can uh, record in uh, children, seven to nine years of age, a bite force of about uh, 450 uh, newtons. But it's more or less the same for both boys and girls. This is increasing uh, in the prepubertal period, comes almost to uh, 550 newtons. And then when we come uh, to adulthood, we see the difference between uh, women and men. And uh, we can see that there is the maximum of 800 newtons for men and about 650 for uh, women. But this is not only uh, the only information we can get, the information that's very interesting is to see that we have a very big variation among the individuals. We have individuals that may have very weak muscles, about 350 uh, to about 
almost thousand um, uh, newtons. So we may expect that these differences that exist in the functional capacity of the muscles may contribute to different growth uh, uh, type of, uh, in the humans. Another way that it is more reliable because uh, the maximal bite force depends on the stimulation of uh, the individuals to bite hard and not on this uh, meter, the gauge, is to measure the cross-section of uh, the muscle. And of course, this can be done with an uh, MRI, but it is very uh, expensive and uh, not that uh, uh, friendly methods for uh, growing individuals. So we try to uh, do it with uh, ultrasonographic recording. And uh, by that, we can get this picture, which can give us an idea about uh, the thickness of the muscle, muscle, which corresponds well after different studies we've done to the forces that they are um, created by the individual. So, what we've seen uh, from the ultrasonographic reports is that we have individuals uh, with thin muscles when they are very young and gradually they are increasing. Of course, the differences between males and females are coming. Uh, during and after puberty. And here we can see also that we have a big variation among the individuals, which give us the hypothesis to think that we have functional capacity of the muscle muscles that uh, presents big variation. We've seen that among individuals, there is a big variation in their form. So is there an association between them? And so the easy way to answer is if we could identify a group of individuals with uh, uh, strong muscles, individuals who work a lot with their muscles, especially during the nighttime, a group of Braxos. And there we have seen that the bite force was bigger in, among the Braxos. And we've seen also that the facial morphology was reminding the one we've seen before in the skulls that it is uh, more close, hyperdivergent, and the gonial angle that was much smaller. And we've tested another group of individuals who are working a lot uh, with their whole body. And you can see, for example, uh, the gentleman here who is uh, pulling up his opponent and he's biting hard. And we want to see if they have a lot of malocclusions, no, they didn't have a lot. And we wanted to see uh, what is their facial morphology. And we've seen that the gonial angle in this group was also uh, smaller than in the control group. So this is what we observed individuals with strong muscles. What about the weak muscles? At that time, I've been uh, uh, working in the lab with muscle fibers, and I have been uh, connected with uh, the group for working with muscle fibers in Gothenburg. It was Professor Gunnar Grimby, who uh, at that time has been initiating a study on myotonic dystrophy adult patients. So I thought, why not? Perhaps I could have the possibility to see if there is some specific uh, dentofacial morphology in these individuals. And first, we want to see if uh, the masticatory muscles suffer also from uh, the disease. And we had the possibility to make uh, some EMG recordings, surface electromographic recordings, that we could see that both masseter and uh, uh, temporal muscle, much lower activity. And of course, this gave as a result to have um, uh, less bite force. Then later, we try to see how is the, the <clears throat> masticatory muscles concerning the also ultrasonographic recordings. And of course, with the healthy individuals, as we have been discussing, there is big variation among the individuals. Here we had the possibility to see that there was uh, variation also, there was 
thinner muscles, but what was very interesting is that uh, we had completely different structure of the muscle. That's obviously signs of regeneration of the muscle. <clears throat> so uh, what we could see is uh, uh, a picture of uh, being very obscure, like uh, lighting the strong lights of your car in fog environment. Because all this connected with uh, adipose tissue was reflecting uh, uh, the ultrasound and getting a picture that was not very distinct. So what about um, the position of the teeth of these individuals? For these adult individuals, we've seen that uh, they had teeth that they were far from being uh, uh, in good position. Here you can perhaps realize that this individual who has a lot of crowding has already extracted many teeth and still the teeth are in crowded position. Then you may see that this individual has an overjet, a big distance between the upper and the lower incisors and tendency to have an open uh, bite. What was very interesting is to see that these individuals had a very narrow palate and deep palate. When we compare, for example, with a healthy individual, you can directly see the difference. <clears throat> what about their facial morphology? I pick up uh, uh, two radiographs, lateral cephalograms, and then you can see that these individuals, uh, they have completely different morphology. Uh, the individual with myotonic dystrophy has a very a hyperdivergent morphology. You can see that the mandible is almost uh, straight, while we compare with somebody who has been uh, grinding the teeth. You can see that it is a very small gonial angle, well uh, established. But these are our two individuals. We want to see what is the mean figure of this group, we can see that both males and females have um, a hyperdivergent form. The multiple, it is more downwards, backwards, and we have an over eruption of uh, the occlusal plane. So, of course, now when uh, you've seen this situation, you may have thought, Okay, we have individuals with this big overjet, with this anterior open bite. Uh, so we make a treatment on these individuals. And I would like to tell you that was something that uh, came in my mind immediately. But the question is that we are missing a lot of information before starting thinking something constructive. And this is a series of questions. For example, when did these characteristics appear? Is the craniofacial growth pattern we have observed in this individual the same one as with helping the children? And another question, if we consider that are the weak muscles created the problems, do all neuromuscular diseases have the same facial characteristics? And then, of course, the next step is what is feasible to achieve with orthodontic treatment? And last but not least, are the treatment results stable? And what is the prognosis of the treatment? Then, in order to say when did the malposition of the teeth appear in the myotonic dystrophy patients, uh, I had uh, the chance to follow a group of uh, myotonic dystrophy uh, children with congenital or early onset of the myotonic uh, dystrophy. And these were more or less all children that uh, they were from the west and south parts of Sweden. And they've been followed up for approximately nine years. So let's see what did they, they find. 
First, something that it is very important for the children and the individuals to keep their teeth is uh, to have a better oral hygiene. We realize that all these children have had very poor oral hygiene, despite the fact that that was in Sweden where uh, the state provides the best care for the children. Then we realize that there is high prevalence of malocclusions. So what are the malocclusions we observe? It is the anterior open bite. And we found that more or less, uh, uh, more than one third had anterior open bite when the control zone was only uh, one tenth. And we found that uh, there is a narrow maxilla. The intermolar width was, was uh, small and it was changing. It was getting smaller by the time. So you can say that uh, the maritonic dystrophy children, they had high prevalence of anterior open bite, they had high prevalence of lateral cross bite, and they had a narrow upper dental arch. And the longitudinal changes that was very important to uh, stress that part is that during the follow up period, the prevalence of malocclusions remained almost the same. We don't have worsening, with exception of the upper intermolar width, which decreased the more the dystrophia mutant capacities. So, what about their morphology? We've seen in adults that it is, there is this hyperdivergent morphology. But when was this morphology established? When we followed up these individuals, we've seen that during this five year period follow up, it was only half degree that the intermaxillary relationship increased. So it is tiny little change. So the big problem has established much earlier. So we can say that in the question, when was this morphology established in myotonic dystrophy patients? We can say early in life. <clears throat> Another question that it is very important to know is do all neuromuscular diseases have the same facial characteristics? And in order to have the possibility to compare with the myotonic dystrophy group, another group that we could find some patients with the Duchenne muscular dystrophy. So the aim was uh, to compare the dental, the cephalometric, and the functional characteristics of patients with Duchenne to healthy controls or to normal values and to relate them to their age. So we found uh, here in uh, the French speaking part of Switzerland, 15 Duchenne patients. The mean age was 12 years, but it was varying between six and a half to almost 20 years of age. And we compared that to the control group. Now I'm going to show you on this cross sectional study certain characteristics that was very interesting to observe. We can see that the situation in this 11 and a half year child, we have, let's say, cross bites. The lower posterior teeth are more um, vestibularly placed. We have some distant uh, occlusion, which gradually is getting worse and worse. But of course, you may say that, well, Stavros, this is a cross sectional study. We cannot compare, though we can see that this is something that is more often found in elder individuals. In young individuals, we didn't have big problems. So when we try to uh, make kind of evaluation about the width of uh, the intermolar distance from the upper and the lower molars, we could see that in respect to controls, the Duchenne, they had very, a huge 
difference between the controls and uh, in the <clears throat> patient group. Of course, these are standard deviation uh, values because we had different uh, ages, so we could not compare all of them. But uh, this indicates that each child, in respect to this age group, was deviating a lot in respect uh, to this uh, intermolar width, mainly in the lower arts than in the upper arts. What about the facial morphology? Well, we could see that uh, the most characteristics of these individuals concerning the vertical relationship was not deviating to the normal. The only deviation we have observed was on the sagittal relationship. That means that these individuals had the tendency to have the mandible more forward placed. Concerning their bite force, we can see that in respect to age, the healthy individuals have a growing bite force. With the Duchenne, we can see that this tendency to decline. <clears throat> and something that is very interesting is to see that the tongue was getting very hypertrophic, possibly because the muscle fibers have been replaced by adipose and connective tissue. Another interesting point is that uh, the leap force in the Duchenne children was about 30% of what it is in the controls, but this force was not declining in the elder and subjects. It's not like the, the bite force. So when we want to ask uh, to what do we know about the interfacial characteristics of children with different neuromuscular disease, we may see that this can be completely different between the different groups of uh, neuromuscular disease. For example, here we have a Duchenne muscular dystrophy, dental alveolar, but not skeletal bites, as we've seen in the myotonic dystrophy. We see tendency to skeletal and dental class three. That means that the mandible is getting bigger. That was not the case in the myotonic dystrophy. It was the opposite. It was more backwards. In both groups, we had lateral prosbytes, but with completely different origin. Here we have a disproportionately wider lower dental arch when compared to an already wide upper one. And now the question is when do these characteristics appear? Well, based on the results of this cross sectional study, the morphological and functional characteristics in the Duchenne patients appear gradually deteriorate with age. <clears throat> Do we have any information from longitudinal observations? As we are going to see from the patient that I followed in uh, Gettebor, you can see that uh, he had, apart this a little anterior combite, a decent posterior occlusion. Some years later, we can see that uh, the teeth, they don't fit together. They start having uh, uh, less contacts between the teeth. And when Matthias got 16 years of age, he has contacts only in the posterior um, last molars. So we try to have a longitudinal study to see if we can get some extra observations from that in these 12 patients that have been followed for two years at least. And uh, we have uh, access to dental casts, lateral cephalograms, and then we had the possibility to record the posterior bite, the force, the lip force, the thickness and the progenity of the master muscles. And what uh, we could observe is that uh, the inter relationship. We had an early development of the posterior cross bite, which is getting bigger and bigger. And then we have later development of lateral open bites. <clears throat> Concerning the intermolar width, 
I want to tell you that this is a stable distance for healthy uh, children. It doesn't change so much. We can see it here. On the contrary, we can see that uh, already from the beginning, this distance was bigger in the young patients, but it's increasing with the age. Why? Most probably, it is because we have the tongue that is getting bigger. And here you can see, you can visualize the situation of one patient. You can see the white is the situation of when uh, this child was 10 years of age. And the green you can see here, it is when the child was about 12 and a half. And the blue is when it is about 15 years of age. And as I told you, for healthy children, this distance remain more or less the same, or we may have 0 0.1 millimeter or 0 0.2 millimeter difference. So what about <coughs> the labial force? It was quite interesting to see that uh, the controls are getting uh, stronger, but these individuals, the Duchenne, they don't have any uh, decrease. The maximal bite force is declining a little, but is getting much more different in uh, bite force concerning the control group. About the thickness of the master mass, something that I want to link to what we didn't manage to do with the tank, because for the moment we don't have any possibility to measure the volume of the tank in an objective way but it can give us a little comparison because we can see that already from the beginning, the mass center muscle was thicker. The volume was bigger than the control group. Both are increasing, but obviously the increase of the mass center muscle was, is not because of uh, the increase of the contracting elements, but it is that deposed on the connective tissue. What about the skeletal changes? As I told you, we found a statistically significant reduction of this angle that expressed the sagittal relationship of uh, the maxilla and the mandible. To make it more simple, it shows that the same children, they get the mandible bigger. And this is something we can see it also in the face. On the contrary, we didn't have vertical changes in these individuals. So to conclude, we can say that Duchenne seems to have an effect on facial morphology, dental art dimensions in oral function. You can see that during the observation period, all measured parameters deteriorated, adding to the pre-existing aberration. We can see that in all patients, we found a remarkable transverse increase of the posterior arches, more in the lower than in the upper, resulting in posterior crossbites. And we have observed skeleton a tendency towards a class three relation. That means that the mandible is getting bigger. So when we come to the question, do all neuromuscular diseases have the same dentofacial characteristics? because all of them, they have weaker muscles. The answer is no. So in the list of questions I have raised before, when did these characteristics appear? Then it depends on the neuromuscular disease. For example, myotonic dystrophy quite early in children. <clears throat> in Duchenne, it comes a little later. Is the craniofacial growth pattern similar to the one of healthy children? We say definitely no. Do all neuromuscular diseases have the same dentofacial characteristics? The answer is no. Then comes the question, what is feasible to achieve with orthodontic treatment? And I would like to uh, tell you that when we have the observation for these Duchenne children, and we've seen that they start gradually to have a wider lower arch. It was 
not rocket science, but just a simple idea. Why not trying to keep the intermolar distance the same to protect uh, the displacement of the teeth because of this increase of the tongue? So we try to put this kind of uh, uh, metallic arch that it is glued to these uh, bands in the last molars. And we can see that after a similar period, when we follow these two individuals, we don't have the same results as we've seen here in individuals who didn't have this bar. Of course, we, can, we don't have tens or hundreds of patients, we've done only you know, three patients per group, and we can see that the, these results are promising. So we have to try to see uh, if we can go on providing at least better occlusal contacts to individuals uh, with Duchenne in respect to uh, what may happen and something that we know that will happen if we don't have this protection. <clears throat> Then another question is, are the treatment results stable? If we try to treat the individuals like individuals we've seen with myotonic dystrophy, what is the prognosis of these individuals? And uh, I would like to show you a case that uh, I have borrowed from a colleague of mine here in uh, the French speaking part of Switzerland. And um, he has been treating these myotonic dystrophy patient and uh, these are the results by the end, almost before the end of the treatment. And of course, he took away the braces. And some years later, we've seen that we had a relapse. <clears throat> so what is the specific with this patient, as we've seen also with the other myotonic dystrophy patients? is that we have this individual hanging the mandible always down. So there is a big freeway space and the posterior teeth possibly are erupting and create this anterior band bite. Of course, now the question is, is it perhaps a better prognosis if the treatment takes place in elder individuals? Not only by means of orthodontics, but also orthodontic surgery. <clears throat> and of course, I cannot provide you uh, results after big studies, but I can show you a case that we had uh, um, access from a colleague that provided this, uh, Dr. Herjo. Um, this young man went to his office when he was uh, 17 years of age, and gradually he started getting. Uh, preparing uh, this individual for doing a traumatic surgical treatment. As you realize, with this uh, only two contacts in the posterior teeth, the functional capacity of this individual, it's very poor. After preparation with uh, orthodontic treatment and then after surgical uh, procedure, he ended up with a distant occlusion at the age of about 19 years. But what happened some years later? Four years later, unfortunately, we had the same problem coming back. And when we wanted to see in the lateral cephalograms, how was the situation initially? We can see that the situation has improved or for the patient doesn't bite. And then what are the results four years later? We could check what has happened, the position, the position of the teeth in respect to these plates, surgical plates. And then we realized that uh, there is an increase in the distance of uh, these, uh, the roots of the molars in respect to the plates which indicates that we have a continuous education of these teeth because perhaps there are not sufficient forces to keep the teeth in occlusion and the teeth go on erupting and they create this relapse. 
So we may conclude that individuals with weak masculine muscles, and that starts early in life, show greater vertical aberration than those with healthy muscles or healthier muscles, as can be the situation with Duchenne, when it is young group of individuals with three, four, five years of age, in respect to myotonic dystrophy, when they have uh, early influence by the disease. Individuals with neuromuscular disease may develop anterior open bite and posterior cross bite, possibly due to different reasons. Either we have decrease of the upper arch, as it is with the myotonic dystrophy, or increase of the lower dental arch, as it is with the Duchenne. <clears throat> And then we have to take into account that the continuous eruption of teeth may influence the long-term stability of the treatment results as is open bite cases. Now, after this presentation, I would like uh, you to think, is there any chance to improve the malposition of the teeth in the skeletal aberrations of children with neuromuscular disease? One can see that any progress that may occur in the medical field that improves the condition of patients with neuromuscular disorders may be useful in decreasing the severity of their dentifacial anomalies. But in the meantime, we need clinical research to prevent or improve the deterioration occurring with time with regard to craniofacial growth and the development of malocclusions. And some of you may say, but these are severe cases. Uh, are there examples where hopeless situations like the one we've seen were improved? And then I would like to tell you that we have an example, an example of Clef Lippen Pilot cases, that in the period of 50s, the results were catastrophic. Tons of research were done in this field. And the results we have now, it is much different than what we've seen at that time. We have the newborn, then we have the intermediate results with many disciplines in implementing this treatment. And then we have a final outcome that it is at least saying this. And with this part saying that if it has been done in a very difficult field, why not with our children with neuromuscular diseases? So we like to see that when we see this smile, we may hope that this smile can be also in children with neuromuscular disease. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Starvos. It was a very interesting uh, presentation, very clear, and uh, it raised many questions, answered a few. We still have questions for you, though. So I would like to invite Jody Allen uh, to unmute and uh, voice the two questions that were written on the chat. Otherwise, I'll, re I'll read them myself. Hi, Jody. Hi there. Um, thank you so much. Really interesting talk. I'm a neuromuscular speech and language therapist over in the UK, and I'm just um, starting my PhD. I'm looking at dysphagia in adults with myotonic dystrophy, um, using ultrasound actually to look at some of the bulbar function and the muscles. So it's really interesting, and I guess everyday speech therapists, we come across or work with patients with um, jaw malalignment, malocclusions, etc. So really helpful. I guess I've got a couple of questions. The first one um, is very practical <laughs> um, and focused on your equipment. I'm just interested um, about the equipment you're using to measure your bite force. Is it a particular gauge in your center or is it? Is there anything that you can recommend for us to, to measure bite force? Well, it's um, a bite force that we have developed uh, 
in uh, the University of uh, Gothenburg in Sweden. Then when I came here in Geneva, we have done another one here. Uh, so I cannot uh, give you uh, indication of where to buy. But I have to tell you that uh, some years ago, that 10 years ago, there was in the market a bite force meter uh, that you could buy from Japan. But unfortunately, it never got uh, this CE uh, acceptance. Branding. You couldn't buy it here. So I have smuggled one from Japan when I was once there. But uh, if you have some friends, you may get this one. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I suspected that might be the answer, actually, but worth a try. Um, and my follow up question. Um, um, relating more to the adult onset myotonic dystrophy patients, I'm wondering whether you think the findings that you um, had in the congenital or the early onset uh, patients with myotonic dystrophy apply in the same way to our um, adult onset myotonic patient group? Concerning the dentofacial, I didn't uh, uh, get the details of your question. Uh, your question concerns the functional part or the dental facial characteristics? Um, I guess to both. I guess question the question could apply to both. Um, I'm interested because I know you talked about the um, the longitudinal changes um, and I wondered whether you thought with the adult onset myotonic dystrophy where symptoms present later in life, whether we you think we would see those longitudinal changes um, in the adult onset group as well? Well, I have to tell you that uh, concerning the adults, we don't have longitudinal results. Uh, but uh, we may say that there can be some uh, changes, but not as uh, big as we could observe in uh, children. Because then we have the growth that occurs, and it is much more extensive than uh, in uh, among uh, adults. Well, in the past, uh, until uh, the 90s, we thought that after the 20, 25, 50 years of age, we don't have any growth of the face. Well, recent studies have shown that there are some um, growth that is equivalent to two years of growth between, let's say, 16 and 18. It is what we can see in uh, two, three decades in adult period. So we may have this uh, influence, but the influence can be limited. So it's not as extensive as in the young ones. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is also the point when um, I, I, I say at the end of my academic career, I was a little disturbed seeing that the muscle, musculatory muscles influence growth, yes, but not in the same extent as I was believing. It, see, it seems that uh, muscles influence the growth much earlier. And when we establish a certain pattern, this it is quite difficult to change. So uh, my hope, and of course, this is for the younger uh, generation of researchers, as it is Professor Anton Arakis, who uh, is interested also in this field of research, you may start much earlier to try to modulate the morphology of these individuals. And it is characteristic that the Duchenne, who have gradually weak muscles, there's no doubt about that, they don't have the same disturbances in the vertical relation because when the facial morphology was established, they, their muscle was pretty normal. I don't say normal, but until the age four, five, six, it was not so bad. So it was above the tolerance that uh, the, the bone could react negatively. Thank you, really interesting. Thank you so much. Thank you, Joby, for your questions. Dipti Bhaskar had a question about how to access bedside, uh, the bite force at the bedside. Uh, Dipti, do, do you want to explain better than me what you intend by that? Hello, uh, I'm, am I audible? Yes, loud and clear. Ah. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I'm uh, Dr. Deepthi Bhaskar, doing my postdoctoral fellowship in neuromuscular disorders from uh, Nimhansa, India. Uh, 
uh, i was uh, actually interested sir uh, in uh, doing ultrasound of the masseter and the uh, tongue muscles uh, i have two queries one is that uh, uh, in the bedside uh, uh, bite force any uh, technique is the clinical technique uh, to assess the bite force and uh, that was the first one and second one is there any specific uh, uh, ultrasonographic patterns of um, involvement of masseter and um, other tongue muscles uh, apart from uh, duchenne's and uh, muscular uh, muscular dis- uh, uh, M- uh, dm uh, any other uh, muscular dystrophies is there any specific pattern is there by which uh, we can um, diagnose such conditions or any special involvement when I mean, special characteristic involvement of these muscles is there let me sum up a little to see if i understood well um, when I wrote, uh, I read your comment, how to assess in the bedside of the bite force. Um, well, I mean, concerning the bite force, if you have this bite coach, you can do it, even if it is uh, the patient lying in bed or if it is sitting on the chair. For sure, if you want to standardize the results, then of course it's, it's good if the patient has a vertical position because uh, it is better to describe it and uh, to give this precise description of the contraction. Concerning the ultrasound that you have mentioned, yes, you can do it also when the patient is sitting or is in bed, but um, be careful because uh, uh, when you take the ultrasonographic recordings, then if the muscles are relaxed, uh, and of course, if the muscle is uh, uh, after the disease not in contraction, then it can be deformed easier when you press against the muscle. So you may detect a thinner, thicker of thickness of muscle. So be aware of that uh, and then just gently touch the probe with a lot of gel on the cheek. And then of course, before starting doing that on uh, individuals with neuromuscular diseases, try to develop uh, your method in healthy individuals. So you have to standardize the method because of course, if you change the inclination of the probe, you may get geometric uh, differences in the recordings. You may, may, it is like the salami. You can take a salami and then you take it perpendicular. The, the thickness it is smaller. If you make it a slice, uh, that's not perpendicular, oblique slice, then you may get longer. So you have to be aware of that. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that uh, explanation. Thank you. Uh, I have a question related to this later one, if you don't mind. And it has to do with the MRI evaluation of the muscles. So as you know, many centers have whole body MRI protocols for muscle assessment. Do you know, or do you think you have any suggestion about uh, how these protocols could be made in a way that would provide also information regarding the muscles of mastication and that you've talked about? Yeah, I think that uh, this could be uh, tempting to get this information because we know from other groups of muscles that uh, there are already uh, mathematical uh, algorithms deciding about how much of the uh, how, how big part of the muscle has been influenced and uh, can show a kind of uh, percentage of the disease, how much the disease has affected the muscle. So it is possible that we can do also the, the muscle muscle or other muscles with MRI because uh, ultrasound has access to the muscle and not to uh, the other muscles, but with MRI we can do that. But it's always a question of uh, resources and uh, access to MRI. Mm-hmm. Uh, the other thing I wanted to ask you is that we frequently uh, ask speech and language therapists like Jody to help us with patients with neuromuscular disorders and other problems like dysphagia or problems, even orthophonic problems, etc. Uh, however, uh, probably uh, my impression when I worked briefly in England 
was that uh, the referral to orthodontics either from uh, the center side sites or from the speech and language therapist was much less common. So uh, I, I see as an obvious indication for such uh, a referral in, in neuromuscular disorders with facial weakness. You've talked about muscular dis uh, about myotonic dystrophy, which is an, a classic. Uh, I was thinking about um, about uh, FSHD, for instance, though, so the facial scapular humeral dystrophy and others with facial uh, involvement. Uh, so uh, apart from these probably very rude clinical criteria for orthodontics uh, referral, what else would you would you recommend as flags? What should we look for? Uh, if we are attentive and wanting to refer our patients early for orthodontic assessment and treatment. Antonio, uh, if I could answer your question uh, 10, 15 years ago, it would be much easier for me. Now, <laughs> what I would say is that we need to concentrate these cases in some central we have to collect information about these children. We have to organize the knowledge that we are going to gather with systematic clinical studies and to evaluate it. As uh, I finished presenting uh, this terrible situation with cleft cases, that was horrible. When everybody was dodging and plunging in uh, this field, providing some results that were uh, let's say reasonable when the child was one year of age and it was horrible some years later. So the results we have today is because many centra has followed up cases, evaluate without have big egoism uh, their cases and they could exchange knowledge and then they could come up to some conclusions and then we have some protocols that they are now well established and we have the most of the children born with uh, cleft lip and palate treated decently. So I think we are in a similar situation. We have first to recognize that the all neuromuscular diseases are not the same. We need to concentrate the knowledge in certain centra, perhaps not uh, to have uh, one center in London and all children will go to London, but at least as uh, we have with cleft cases, you need 20, 30 K center where people can go in UK or in uh, countries like Finland, they could have two, three center. It can be like Sweden, three, four uh, centers where we are going to have the treatment of these children. And then we can collect the information, work on that, and then I think in 10, 20 years, we may have something useful coming out. But uh, if it is just the prophet coming saying, do that, I think I will doubt uh, the opinion of the prophets. I could be prophets 15 years ago, but not now. OK. But that's a fair and honest question, uh, answer. And I think that uh, the European Reference Network structure is something that would allow probably those things to happen because we unite different centers. For instance, Gothenburg is one of our neuromuscular centers in the, in the network. So we, we, we can surely try to uh, create a kind of uh, orthodontics sub network of expert centers that would address that. And I, I think that would work and probably progress uh, knowledge. One last question that I just don't resist to ask you, were your DMD patients, uh, Duchenne patients on steroids or not? They have, as I told you, these patients have been collected some years ago. Now they are. Now they have, we have some improvement of, uh, fortunately, of uh, the, the progress of the disease. But uh, some of the cases, like I've shown you, where children been uh, treated or I met them uh, 
30 years ago. Uh, for example, the guy I show you, Matthias from Sweden, was in the 80s. So uh, his brother passed away some years before him. He had the chance to get some help and he could have a longer life. And I think uh, we may have uh, some improvement of uh, these individuals. Also the neuro in the, the facial morphology, as I have mentioned, but since uh, it may take years until we get something uh, coming completely correct out of it. So we have to, to struggle in parallel. Okay, but if, if the answer, if I understood well the answer, probably they were not on steroids and your findings become even more significant in yeah. that case because you don't have to account for that confounding effect. Yeah. Okay, excellent. It seems that we run out of questions and run out of time. Thank you very much. As I say, I want to keep in touch with you. I think there are very good ideas from your lecture today that we should discuss later. And I hope you agree. And uh, from our side will be a pleasure. Your webinar was recorded and will be also available on demand on our website later. And um, I hope to discuss with you very soon. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Antonio. It was very kind of you for getting this invitation. And I think uh, uh, coming to this part of my life, professional life, uh, it's going to be a pleasure to see that some of the work we've done can be useful for these children. I'm sure they are, and I'm sure that we've learned a lot here uh, today. Okay, thank you. Bye. Thank, thank you. you all. Thank you. Bye bye.